So I've been talking about how Revelation cycles. So actually, I hadn't brought this up, but we're really entering into another cycle. So one of the keys to understanding cycles in Revelation is, the thing for me anyway, is I'm always looking for final judgment language, and we're going to run across that in chapter 14. And so 12, 13, and 14 kind of produce another cycle. Final judgment is going to show up again in chapter 14. 12 and 13 seem to be a focus on the persecution that the church is facing. So we have this unholy trinity, the dragon and these two beasts. So uh, now earlier we had the, the trumpets. It seemed to be focusing. It had the cycle event too, but it seemed to be focusing on uh, persecution that uh, are God's judgment. I'm sorry, I misspoke. God's judgment against those who are persecuting Christians, what God can do. And if God was able to do this, that would be encouraging for the Christians. But not only that, just to hear this, it would be encouraging for the Christians to maintain their faithfulness to God. This is the key to this whole thing. They're going through difficult times. And John's telling them, remain faithful, remain faithful, no matter what you go through, remain faithful. Because the life after this life is what we're really, that's our goal, isn't it? We tend to think about this life and hanging on to this life. But the life beyond this is unending. And James, in a very practical manner, that's one of the good things about James, is when he writes, he's very practical. He says in chapter 4, he says, your life is just a wisp. Just a wisp, what you have here on earth, compared to what is coming up later. And so we need to remember that, even though we think 70 or 80 years or 90 or 100 um, it's nothing compared to the unendingness of what is coming. And so you remain faithful to God so that you can continue to be with God or continue to have life. So. Okay, so uh, now, <laughs> this comes up anytime you teach Revelation, but especially during the political season. So I want to talk about this because when we get into 13, we're really talking about governing authorities. So don't fall into the trap trying to project our American system onto this, what's going on here. Don't do that, okay? You're going to miss everything. And don't listen to anybody, politicians especially. They're the worst theologians. If I was having cardiac problems, I wouldn't hire a plumber. If I wanted to know about theology, I'm not going to listen to a politician. So they don't know, they're not, they're misguided. And that's all I'm going to say about that. I don't even want to get into that. But anyway, so I want to look at some texts, okay? To talk in a positive, in a positive sense about government and where Christians fit into this. So let's start off by turning to Romans 13. So Paul's writing in Romans 13. He's writing uh, during a time that there's a monarchy. He's within the Roman Empire. The ruler is Nero, who I've said was a bad character, but that doesn't matter to Paul. He's pretty clear in Romans 13. And he says this in Romans 13, 1 through 7. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe. If you owe, pay taxes. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Which is really odd. Because like I said, we're looking at a monarchy. So Paul says, just submit. That's what he says. Bad government situation, submit. Um, God is a God of order. He establishes order. That's the key for God. He likes order. 
and he sees this means as establishment of order. Uh, that doesn't mean God's working through the government necessarily, but he's established this institutional idea. Okay, and Christians just fit in this. We're like a, an island in a sea, kind of in a sense. We're a part of this, but we're not really a part of it. Now turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. theme in 1 Peter is holiness. So, Peter is not going to condemn any activity that goes against our call for holiness. So, no simple activity. But it does say this about governing authorities. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, not like supreme over God, but supreme as the governing authority, uh, whatever government, governing authority they're under. Or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of the foolish. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show respect to everyone. Love your fellow believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. So again, we're to submit, except where I would say if there was a mandated sinful activity. So... Now, when we look at Revelation 13, we're going to, it's going to start talking about governing authorities also, but these governing authorities are going to be very, they're going to be harsh against Christians. So this is where the key comes in. So in a sense, Revelation is kind of turning things around, uh, whereas we no longer see this government as a servant of God, but more as like a servant of Satan. And it used in a means to attack Christians. So how do we how do we deal with that kind of idea? Well, this is what Revelation 13 is all about. So Rome is going to start causing lots of problems for Christians. So let's turn to Revelation 13. The reason why I brought this up is because um, it often comes up when you're looking at Revelation. But I an interesting, interesting story. I was at church one time, and uh, there was a political activist there. I think that their their mission was to record how every politician voted within their district or something, which is fine. I mean, that's great to do. But he was asking me what I thought about all of it, and I was like, well, I don't really get politically involved, but I do know that Romans 13 teaches this, and 1 Peter 2 teaches this, and all I'm called to do is submit, unless that government, the governing authority demands or mandates some kind of sinful activity, which I think this person didn't like hearing. So I think he was going to get, get me caught up in political activism, but I can't do that anyway. Just from the position I'm in the church, I can't do that. It would be unethical. But the second thing is, is that I really don't think Scripture necessarily teaches that. I'd be more focused in the church. So, so I kind of sum it up at the end. Um, is that as you read the New Testament, it's much different than the Old Testament. We see in the Old Testament God working through Israel. But Israel is really a small, small, small country. Very, very small. So when we move to the New Testament, God starts working through the church, which is much, much bigger and can cross across, uh, can cross across ethical uh, boundaries, social boundaries, uh, gender boundaries, uh, financial boundaries, so forth. So it's much, much bigger. So God's working through a, um, with much more capacity when he works through the church. Okay? So God loves the church in Kenya just as much as he loves the church in Southern Illinois. He loves the church in, in Japan just as much as he loves the church in Kentucky. God's not really concerned about countries. He's concerned about people and he's using the church as his tool to make a difference. So don't try not to get these things all crossed up. I try to focus on the church. So 
Any questions or comments about that? Okay, so we're not going to read any modern day <coughs> political ideas into this. I'll tell you a story at the very end if there's if I have time, it'll fit in with what we're doing. Um, about how somebody asked me, uh, it was a good question, but it was kind of far fetched. Okay, go to the next slide, please, Eli. Okay, so Revelation 13, is it working? So we have these two pieces show up in Revelation 13. Now, it's interesting that Revelation 13, at the very beginning, um, my text reads, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. Does yours read something similar to that? Or he stood on the shore of the sea? It's actually he in there. It's not really the dragon. And I stood on the sand of the sea. And I? Yeah, then I. And it's got an A, so it says, in text reads him. Yeah, it should be. Should be he or something to that effect. This is thirteen. Yeah, and he's yeah, and he stood. Uh, it should be he. Yours does? Does yours say I still? It says the first verse said, and I saw a beast rising okay. out of the sea. Okay. With ten horns and seven heads and ten diadems on its Thirteen and one. Yeah. And blasphemous names on its heads. Mine says the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it, this is the way it would go. I and I stood on the at on the lake shore, and a beast came up, having uh, having ten heads and ten or ten crowns and ten heads, seven and on or on his heads. So anyway, the point of mine I'm trying to say is even if we read the dragon there or the beast, it doesn't really matter because the dragon's going to give the beast authority. But the position of this character, the beast or dragon, however it is, is on low ground. So now turn to chapter 14. Yeah, look at verse 1. Then I looked, and before me was the Lamb. Well, who's the Lamb in Revelation? Jesus, standing on Mount Zion, a position of a pie. Think about mil a military kind of picture here. Where does the military, where do you want to defend from? The low ground or the high ground? High ground. High ground. So what's he saying about Jesus here? He's in a position of authority. He has a better position. So that's really what's going on here. Is even when you look at 13 and you come out of it, you're like, whoa, these beasts are like terrifying. You go right to 14, and it's like, Jesus is way up here on the mountain, looking down. And also about these beasts. This beast of the sea has ten horns and ten crowns and seven heads. The horn is a symbol of strength, like a bull. This idea is often presented in the Psalms um, as like grabbing a horn, or the horn of the Lord is my strength, that kind of idea. Crown is a symbol of authority, and then uh, the heads are a symbol of leadership. So this beast has all these things. But not only that, the head has slanderous names written all over. Your text may say blasphemy. Blasphemy just means slander. So it's saying something derogatory about Jesus and God. Jesus is no good. God's no good. Uh, whatever. They're slandering. It's slandering God. Um, now this beast resembles this hybrid of mixture of animals. So we have a hybrid of a leopard, a bear, and a lion. So we want to turn to Daniel chapter 7. So turn your Bible to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7 is a really great chapter too, guys. Really, really good chapter. <clears throat> so, verses 2 through 7.
Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the other, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched it until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being, and a human mind was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up, and eat your fill of flesh. After that I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings, like those of a bird. This beast had four heads and was given authority to rule. After that in my vision I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the other former, uh, all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. Um, now there's a little spill there. We go down to verse nine. So this is an interesting part of the text too. It doesn't have a lot to do with Revelation, but it has a lot to do with New Testament stuff. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. The Ancient of Days has to be a reference to God. I mean, that's what he calls him for some reason, the Ancient of Days. It's the idea of a, a very old person, eternal, eternal something. But it has to be a reference to God. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was like uh, wool, white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Um, now go down to verse 13. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Son of man's important because that's Jesus' favorite title for himself. And it literally means of humanity. I saw the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days, or God, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, that's the Son of Man, was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So this is a, a hope in Daniel. Daniel, I don't really think Daniel has any idea about Jesus at this time. Now, Jesus is going to come along later, and he's going to fill some of these ideas. But Daniel's writing in a time when they're actually hoping for something to happen, but it's not going to happen until later. So the beast, the first beast, the lion, is most likely a reference to Babylon. Daniel's writing during the kingdom of Babylon. Second, the bear is probably a reference to Persia. Daniel lives long enough to see the Persians overcome the Babylonians. The third beast, the leopard with the four heads and the wings, is a reference to Greece. Undoubtedly, it's a, a reference to Greece with Alexander the Great. Because after Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was split into four, between four generals. And then the last beast talks about being terrifying and frightening. It's probably actually one of those Greek empires that split out of Alexander the Great's empire and ended up being very problematic for the Israelite people or for the Jewish people. It would be the Seleucid Empire. And so... This is a time when, uh, in the second century, uh, 200 years before Jesus, Jewish people were persecuted by Greeks. And so during this, they're hoping for some relief from God, and Daniel uh, is a part of this and pins this. Uh, but Jesus comes along later and uses the same language, and this is what gets, him, gets people, the chief priests and the scribes, so mad at him. Because he says, you'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. And they know exactly what he's talking about. Language from Daniel. You're saying you're a Messiah? Yeah, I am. That's the language I'm using. The Son of Man will come riding on the clouds. You'll see it. And that's what he's talking about. So. But anyway, so Revelation pulls this image of these beasts from Daniel. You see those? They have the lion and the leopard and the bear. Uh, he pulls all that from Revelation. To tell us. Because in Daniel, it is certainly talking about governing authorities. So if Daniel's pulling, or if John's pulling this language from Daniel, where it was talking about governing authorities, we are probably safe to assume 
that in Revelation 13, John is using similar type of language to talk about governing authority again, except this time it's going to be Rome. You can turn back to Revelation 13 now. So we have this image. So what happens is the dragon gives this beast authority. And then later on, this beast is going to give this beast authority. So all this authority is derived from what we would consider the evil, an evil source. Now remember, in 12, uh, because the dragon could not swallow the child, remember talking about that being the birth of Jesus and how the dragon was not able to stop that? Uh, he pursues the woman, and we have all this imagery of going into the desert and God helping out the woman. And that uh, we have the picture of Satan being cast out. And we talked about how that happens because of Christians. Satan can no longer accuse Christians. He's cast out. So he goes, he's angry, and he's going to do, he's going to war against Christians. <coughs> but we also have language in Revelation that God's people are protected. So in a sense, Satan cannot directly do anything to the Christians. But he can use non-Christian sources against the Christians. And that's where John's going with this. He is saying that the dragon is going to use Rome against the Christians. So this beast, like I said, receives power and authority. But the power and authority is limited. We have these limitations all over Revelation. And it helps to remind us even though we see the dragon doing this or Satan doing this, we know that God uh, can provide protection, but not only that, he can limit the activity. And so there's a limitation there. So now I don't what you think. Like I said last week, the top being is God. Everything else is created. There is nothing even close to the power that God can exhibit or display. We can't even think about Satan having like half of God's power. Or even a tenth not even fathomable. We can't think like that. There is nothing out there. There is nothing in it that can even have a fraction of the power that God has. And God can stop anything he wants to, or he can allow things to happen. Uh, but we do see in this picture that we have, there's an influence here of Satan, and he is going to use these beasts against the church. Um, this beast it is admired by the people. Okay? So, um, I'll just keep that in mind. I want to talk about that here in a minute. But this beast is admired by the people. Okay? All the people that are non Christians admire this beast. And it goes to make war against the Christians. Now, this beast has what seems to be a fatal wound. In Revelation 5, when the lamb is presented, it's talked about as one who had a fatal wound. Well, we know what's going on there, right? We know why they talk about the lamb having a fatal wound. It's because the lamb is a picture of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. He was resurrected. Now, think about, think about this for a minute. This comes from the Gospel of John. So we have Thomas. This is where we get doubting Thomas. You ever heard someone say that? You're a doubting Thomas. Well, Jesus shows up to the disciples, and Thomas can't believe it. You're not real. And what does Jesus tell Thomas to do? Put his fingers. Touch, touch the holes in my hands. Put your hand in my side. So even after Jesus was resurrected, these wounds had not healed. They're still there. And so I think that's the picture we're getting in chapter 5 of Revelation 2. The lamb who had been wounded. Are mortally wounded. And then we have this beast as a parody. What seemed to have a mortal wound. Parody is like a sarcastic remark. It's really a, uh, it's kind of a joke at the expense of someone else. And the, the one who, who um, uh, one of the characters would then end up having a, a, a lesser distinction in the, than the, the previous one. So the beast is actually a lesser distinction, 
and is using this language to try to equate it with the one of the higher distinction. Okay, and we have uh, the la language of power and authority here, as if this character has the same power as Jesus or God. Now, it might seem that Rome is very powerful, but John wants to remind Christians they do not have any power compared to God. It's not even a consideration. Uh, this fatal wound idea, too. Let me talk about this for a moment. Not only does it have this parody with the lamb idea, but also there was a popular story that was circulated during those times about Nero. So by the time John had, uh, had written Revelation, which I think we could probably say in the 90s, probably 95-ish, probably be on firm ground there. The Emperor Nero, who had went completely mad killed himself, he committed suicide, had been dead for uh, 25 years. Now, what's so important about Nero is this. Nero was the last of the line from Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was the guy to them. Augustus Caesar was the guy to them. This is a line of Caesars that came from the Julian line. And Nero is the last one. And they're connecting. People are connecting the heyday with Augustus and Julius. So anybody who comes from that line, maybe they'll have that greatness within them. Well, Nero was the last. There's a huge civil war after Nero dies. Finally, someone is able to, to uh, take control of Rome, and uh, a new dynasty starts. But the Julian line was over. But some people wanted that Julian line to remain, so they created a legend that Nero really didn't die. He just escaped to the east, to the land of Parthia. And someday he's going to come back with a huge army, and he's going to conquer Rome again. So this legend started. So that's probably why they're talking about this beast that looks like it has a fatal wound. It's not really dead. It's a tie to government again, with Nero as the main subject of that type of government but that this line of authority will come back again. Now that's important for us because as we're studying Revelation, we could say that the beginning of persecution against Christians actually started with Nero. So it started in the 60s. And it's going to happen again in the 90s. So he's tracing that back. So he's saying, he's using this legend to identify Nero. So Nero's going to become important for us. He was the beginning of the Christian persecution. So let me talk about first century considerations and then we'll stop and take a moment to ask any questions, okay? So we just talked about one beast so far. We've got to talk about the other beast. But let me just talk about some first century considerations about Rome. So the entire Mediterranean area was mesmerized with Rome. They were mesmerized with them. They loved Rome. They wanted to be like Rome. Rome was where all the wealth was at. It was a huge city for that time. It had probably a million citizens. That's citizens. That's not counting slaves. It could have been a million five, two million counting slaves. It was a huge city. Now that's phenomenal for that time, that time uh, uh, in that historical time frame. Uh, that is uh, really remarkable. Everybody wanted to be like Rome. So what they did, they tried to curry favor from Rome. Even though we have this Roman Empire, and we can think about an empire, we can't think of like our present day structure of governance. That's not the way it is. Basically, Rome was an empire within itself, and it conquered other people, and those other people paid tribute to Rome, and they gave their allegiance to Rome. So if Rome needed some help in the eastern part of the empire, well, guess what? Some, some armies from Asia Minor would have to help them out they, to, to, uh, to play out that loyalty aspect. But not only that, cities would build temples to the goddess of Rome, Roma. And the chief priest to this goddess was the emperor, who became like a cohort. Uh, and they would build 
uh, temples to the emperors too. Well, that carried favor with Rome. So then whenever they had any kind of trouble with disasters or anything, Rome might help them out with help or consider them to be an outstanding city or, or whatever. But everybody was mesmerized by Rome. They wanted to be just like Rome. Which is kind of startling for me because of the way we think about America sometimes and we think everybody wants to be like us. Which is, if we're following Roman history, that's not a good thing. But anyway. So, the Emperor Domitian. He ruled from 81 to 96. So this is the emperor in the time frame of Revelation. Now, he was a very poor ruler. He was not well liked by the Senate. He was a tyrant. And according to early Christian sources, he persecuted Christians. I want to pause real quick right here just for a second, okay? So when you're watching History Channel or other channels, and I encourage you to, to watch those things. If you come across something about Revelation, and they're talking about historical events, which I hope they do, and they don't talk about Hollywood ideas that are presented about Revelation. They're actually talking about historical situations. They may say something to the effect of that we don't have uh, real good historical sources that would say specifically that Domitian persecuted Christians. But that's not entirely true. We do have early Christian sources that do. But a lot of these people just dismiss this kind of history. Now, we don't have an abundance of it. We have to be frank. We don't have an abundance of evidence. But we do have evidence. And the evidence points to the fact that Domitian was very harsh to Christians. But he was also harsh to his own people. So that's why after he died, the Roman Senate would not even honor him. In fact, they probably threw a party. I'm glad he's gone. He was hated. And he was assassinated, too. So, um, now, Christianity within the Roman Empire was a, a minority. So we have to think about this, too. Christianity is not a large group. It's not a large faction. They don't have uh, the power of, of uh, a huge following. They're very, very minor. Everybody in the ancient world was worshiping something. They were worshiping something. They may have been worshiping Zeus. That would be the Greek name of a Greek god, but the Roman name would be Jupiter. They may be wor uh, worshiping Artemis. Ephesus, they worshiped Artemis. Uh, the Greek name's Artemis. The Roman name is Diana. They may have been worshiping Dionysus, which is one they really liked to worship because he was the god of wine. They really liked him. Because when you worshiped him, you just sit around and drink a lot of wine. So his name in Greek was Dionysus. His Roman name was Bacchus. Uh... Mithras was another one that was worshipped a lot. Isis, an Egyptian god. And so on and so on. My point is, everybody's worshipping something. So when disasters come along, when there's a, an earthquake, because there were lots of earthquakes in this area at this time, in, in Asia Minor, Turkey. When an earthquake happened, guess what the people thought? We must not be worshiping our God, our, our God well enough. We've got to become more devoted. We've got to get behind this God. She'll protect us. Or he'll protect us. So anytime anything bad happened, it was always the result of a lack of worship by the people. So Christians come along. And your neighbor knocks on your door. Says, we really got to pay some some allegiance to Zeus, so we have a good year on our, on our crops this year. We, we really got to make a great sacrifice and, and really put some effort into this worship. And the Christian says, I can't do that. I, I worship God. I can't worship another God. Well, that person might think like, okay, well, yeah, those silly Christians, we'll, we'll let it go this time. But then at the end of the year where there's a drought and the crops fail, now what does that person think about the Christian? They didn't worship Zeus. 
And that's because that caused our drought. We're going to go hang that guy by his thumbs. And that's the way these people thought. <clears throat> so Christians are putting themselves in a very tough place. They're a small faction in a world where everybody's worshiping something. That's the big hang up with Paul in, in Acts uh, 19. When the, the big turmoil, the, 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 uh, oh, the, the crowd breaks out in a, a riot in uh, Ephesus because of Artemis. And they're like, that Paul, the silversmith comes up and says, that Paul, he's hurting my business. Nobody's buying my idols anymore. Well, that translates into not only am I not making any money, but also we don't have enough people devoting themselves to Artemis. We're going to have some bad things happen. And it's all because of that stupid Paul. we got to get it. Everybody's worshiping something. Um, and even if some knew about the Christian movement, they considered those people deplorable. So let me read on page one, at the very bottom here, going into page two. Actually, it's all right here, page one, I'm sorry. This is an actual report from a gentleman by the name of Tacitus. Tacitus is one of our best sources for history at this time. He was a Roman. He was actually, he was part of the senatorial class of citizens, so he's the upper class. He worked in politics his whole life. He was a senator. Then he became a prefect of Rome under the reign of Domitian. He wants to extol the greatness of Rome, which he sees back in the times of Augustus. And he sees after Augustus just a downward spiral of the Roman Empire because of these knucklehead empire emperors that have been ruling. And he's like, the other historians, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, but this is kind of what he says, the other historians have written uh, flattering tales about history. I'm going to write the real story. And so he begins. He retires after Domitian's assassinated. He retires, and around the beginning of the second century, he starts to write. He writes four books. This is one of the books about the history going from Augustus to Nero. So he writes, <clears throat> Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians, by the populace. Christus, he, he uh, misspells the name here. Actually, it's Christos, the way he spells it. He misspells it because he doesn't even understand about Christ, but he knows a little bit. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our, one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous, a mischievous superstition uh, thus checked out, checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. That superstition is Christianity. Where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become very popular. So he has a very negative view about Christians and Christianity and about Jesus and anything else. So even though a lot of people didn't know about Christianity, some did, and they just hated it. Okay, before we go on, we'll stop there, and if there are any questions at this time, we'll address those if we have any. So Christians are hated. Everybody's worshiping something so they don't have disasters. If Christians don't get involved, then they're even in worse trouble with the, the local people. Satan is going to be using the government of Rome against Christianity. Um, that's where we're at right now. So the beast of the sea would probably be a reference to Rome or the goddess Rome. The whole system of Rome. <coughs> Their hope is about Rome. They love Rome. So it would be what it's about. Okay, we'll go to the second beast. Beast of the Lamb. <clears throat> so the second beast has two horns like a lamb. I don't know why it says that. Because the lamb in Revelation 5 does not have horns. 
But I think what it's trying to say is that this beast has equal power with Jesus, which is a farce. It's not so. But evil will try to purport that it has equal power with goodness or God or whatever else you want to think of. Um, it's given the authority, has the same authority as the beast of the sea. It has the ability to do miraculous powers. I want to read the second part. The second part. This comes from Tacitus also. It's about a gentleman by the name of Vespasian. So Vespasian was a military general in Rome. So in 66, when the Jewish people revolted against Rome, Vespasian was a general that was sent to put down the rebellion. He laid siege to Jerusalem. Now, during this, this, this rebellion lasted for four years, 66 to 70. In 67, 68, somewhere around there, Nero commits suicide. When Nero commits suicide, three generals start a civil war in Rome. Vespasian's not a part of it, but three other generals start a civil war. Each of them will get the upper hand and declare themselves to be emperor. They'll be emperor for a couple months. Then the other one will have gained power, and they'll be emperor for a couple months. Then the third one will gain power, and they'll be emperor for a couple months. And this went on for like a year. Well, Vespasian was really a... Um, he was a practical man. Let's just put it that way. He wasn't a Christian, but he was a practical man. And he was thinking, we can't have the Roman Empire going through this. This is just this not going to work. So he actually goes back to Rome, raises an army, and he puts down the whole rebellion and becomes emperor himself. And this starts the Flavian dynasty. When he leaves, his son, Titus, is the one who takes over the siege of Jerusalem. So Vespasian, because he's the first emperor after that Julian line, he has to, there were stories told about him in order to add his significance. <coughs> Part of those stories are about his ability to miraculously heal people. Now, did he? I don't think so. I think they're all made up stories. But they're stories in a way to elevate the status of Vespasian. Now, this cuts us two ways as Christians. It can against someone who's arguing against Christianity. Because the story we're going to read is very similar to a healing story in Jesus' time. So people would say that this is a common story that was told about people that healed people, and so Jesus didn't do it. Well, I don't, I don't think that adds any kind of significance to their argument. Uh, Jesus did heal, and the stories do appear in the Gospels, and they're true. But it does cut us both ways. But I do want you to understand this about Vespasian, because in Revelation, it talks about this beast having the ability perform signs and wonders. So, this middle section. Let me read this middle section to you. In the course of the months which Vespasian spent at Alexandria, that would be in Egypt, waiting for the regular seasons of summer winds when the sea could be relied upon, many miracles occurred. They sent, uh, these seem to be indications that Vespasian enjoyed heaven's blessings and that the gods showed a certain leaning towards him. Among the lower classes at Alexandria was a blind man, whom everybody knew as such. One day this fellow threw himself at Vespasian's feet, imploring him with groans to heal his blindness. He had been told to make this request by Serapis, which was an Egyptian goddess. The favorite god of a nation, much addicted to strange beliefs. He asked that it might please the emperor to anoint his cheeks and eyeballs with the water of his mouth. Remember what Jesus, how Jesus heals one time a guy's blind? What does he do? Spits into his hands. It's his hands on his eyes. <clears throat> a second petitioner who suffered from a withered hand pleaded his case too, also on the advice of Serapis. Would Caesar tread upon him with the imperial foot? At first, Vespasian laughed at them and refused. When the two insisted, he hesitated. At one moment, he was alarmed by the thought that he would be accused of vanity if he failed. At the next, the urgent appeal to the two victims and the flatteries of his entourage 
made him sanguine of success. Finally, he asked the doctors for an opinion, whether blindness and atrophy of this sort were curable by human means. The doctors were eloquent on the various possibilities. The blind man's vision was not completely destroyed, and if certain impediments were removed, his sight would return. The other victim's limbs had been dislocated, but could be put right by correct treatment. Perhaps this was the will of the gods, they added. Perhaps the emperor had been chosen to perform the miracle. Anyhow, if a cure were effected, the credit would, be, would go to the ruler. If it failed, the poor wretches would have to bear the ridicule. So Vespasian felt that his destiny gave him the key to every door and that nothing now defied belief. With a smiling expression and surrounded by an expectant crowd of bystanders, he did what was asked. Instantly, the cripple recovered the use of his hand, and the light of day dawned upon his blind companion. Both these incidents are still vouched for by eyewitnesses, though there's nothing to be gained by lying. Tacitus. So these legends come about uh, pertaining to the emperors. That these emperors have miraculous abilities and powers to heal. Did they? No, they didn't. Is Satan working through them? I don't think so. I think they're all made up stories just to augment their reigns. Now, the people of that time may, may have thought of them being true. Uh, people that didn't know any better may have thought this is possible. Maybe it is possible for best patient to actually heal. Maybe this guy does have powers like that. And so John writes in here about this other beast that Form signs and wonders. But still, still, John wants people to know God is way beyond these people in power. So over and over again, John's trying to help us to understand that this is all about Rome. And the false prophets, or this isn't the false prophet, the beast of the land is probably a reference to emperors or people who are associated with the imperial cult. A cult that would go around and, and try to, well, they were co coercing people through threat or violence many times to worship the emperor. <coughs> so this beast of the land serves as an advocate of the sea. Okay, now we're getting to the point where we're gonna talk about 666. Is everybody comfortable where we're at? Questions? Okay, 666. Here we go. Turn your slide, please. So the mark of the beast seems to be a parody. There we go. Well, the mark of the beast seems to be a parody. Um, it's about receiving this mark and then you can you can do commerce. Well, if you look in verse in chapter 14 also you'll see um, in verse 1, the very end of verse 1, that Jesus stands on this mountain and he has this huge uh, group with him. And we'll deal with 144,000 soon. It's not a literal number, but it's a huge group. And on this, uh, this group, they have on their uh, forehead a name written. Name of the Father. So they have a mark on them. But also it's a parody coming from Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul tells us, that the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a mark, a down deposit for our future inheritance. So this is a complete parody against Christianity. Now, if you look in your text, in chapter 13, because you think about this number where, where six. Where did you say that was at, Paul? Ephesians 1, verse 14. I mean, 14. Where the spirit is a, a mark of a deposit, a down deposit of our future inheritance. <clears throat> um, did I give you a paper? Because it's on that paper. No, yeah, the box. Didn't see it. Okay. Um, so when we think about this mark and stuff, have any of you ever seen the movie The Omen? Omen. Oh, yeah. And the uh, Antichrist figure. Where's the 666 at? It's on his head, right? On his head. Forehead. That's on his head. That's on his head somewhere. I think it's right behind his ear. It's like a tattoo there. Anyway, so, um, but if you look at verse, um, look at verse 17. 
tells us something about this number. <clears throat> so it says, this is chapter 13, verse 17. So that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast. So the mark is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So this is odd. And the number is 666. Six. Okay. This might be a little complicated, so if there's a question at any moment, just stop me. Okay. So, um, have any of you ever had a clock in your house that had Roman numerals on it? Could you tell the time on it? Could you know what time it was? So what's a B stand for? Five. What's an X stand for? Ten. What's a L stand for? Fifty. Fifty, okay, very good. These are not actual numbers in themselves, though. They are actually characters in an alphabet. So an I is one, right? They're, they're characters in, a, in an alphabet. Characters that represented numbers, like the way we write numbers, one or two or three or four, were not invented until the sixth century. So at this time, if they wanted to represent a number, they had to use letters out of their alphabet. So in Greek or Hebrew, what they would do is they'd put little dots above the characters. So when you're reading along, you see that little dot, you're like, oh, he's talking about a number now. Instead of vocalizing it like a word. So they didn't have uh, characters for numbers. They had to use letters. The process is called gematria. It's in your handout. I think it's on the back page. It's called gematria. <clears throat> so, when we take the name um, Caesar Nero, actually, it's Caesar Nero, actually, the way you should say it. We don't, it's a hard sounding C. And you take that name and you reproduce that name using Hebrew sounds that correlate. So it's not being translated into Hebrew necessarily. It's just saying, here are the sounds that are represented in Greek for, C for uh, Caesar Nero. We're going to take those same sounds and we're going to represent them in Hebrew. So when John is writing about this, he's talking about, he's, he, the audience has to know what's going on. Have to know. So if you take these and you put them back into a Hebrew script and you use the numbers that are associated with that Hebrew script, it adds up to 666. Six, six. And it's pointing to uh, Caesar Nero. Now, I'm 100% sure that this is right because in the early uh, 3rd, 4th century, there was a manuscript, that, there's a manuscript that's been found, it's been dated to the early 3rd or 4th century. And actually, I've seen a digital copy of it, uh, interestingly. And uh, so I can verify, because I've seen it with my own eyes, that there is a, a writing that says, and the number of the beast is 6 1. Six. I bet it's in your study Bible. Does it have it in your study Bible in the notes? Yes. It does, doesn't it? 616? Okay. So this early 3rd or 4th century manuscript comes out with, and the number of the beast is 616. Well, how did he get that wrong? Well, there is a way. He didn't get it wrong. He's just trying to share the message in a different way. So the person who wrote this manuscript is speaking to a Latin audience. And they're taking, uh, they're, the way the Latins would have spelled uh, Caesar Nero is a little bit different than the way the Greeks would have. There would have been one letter that would have been dropped off. And it's the letter that corresponds to the 50. One of the, it's an N, actually it's an N sound. One of the N's would have been dropped off. Well, you take 50 off of 666 and you get what? Six. One, six. So he's speaking to a Latin audience. 
not to a Greek audience, but to a Latin audience. And he's telling them the same thing. The beast is Caesar Nero. In our language, it adds up to 616. But in the Greek setting, the way they would have spelled it, it would have added up to 666. As it is depicted with Hebrew characters. I know that's really, really complicated. So, far away. <laughs> far away. Huh? Oh, good. I'm glad. We know one thing that the name is, it says the name is a number, right? And the number is a name. So it gives us an, a, a hint right there. Or it says the, uh, the name of the beast or the number of its name. So he's putting it out there that way. Well, your definition makes perfect sense. This, this study Bible gives that and it gives another explanation. Another explanation saying that the, you know, the Holy Trinity represents the yeah. perfect number 777 and the unholy Trinity represents an unperfect number of 666. Some people try to explain it that way, but this information that that I'm talking about has only been found out in the last probably 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. So it's really newer information. So a long time ago, people didn't know what to do with it. So they were thinking, well, 666, hmm, that's one short of seven. We had three sevens, that would be, that would be complete perfection. Well, Trinitarian, Trin Trinitarian perfection. So 666 would be imperfect uh, man's number or something to that effect, but that's not what's going on. It's really trying to identify the Caesar character. So, when it identifies Caesar Nero, now remember, this guy's really important because he's the first emperor to start persecuting Christians. <clears throat> 25 years later, we have another one that's starting up again. So John's trying to help us to understand. Your enemy is the beast, and that beast is Rome, and the emperor that drives this beast. And all this is coming from Satan. Understandable? So does that help you with the 666? Does that help you understand the beast imagery and all that? No, that's one of the only things in Revelation I could probably say I'm like 100% sure that I'm right on. <laughs> Everything else I can say, well, I'm probably about 85%. Maybe on this, I might be 92. Maybe on this, I'm only 67. On this one, the number thing, I'm 100% sure. But that's the part. I think that's the whole piece that's the scariest part. Just thinking that maybe it's your social security number, and maybe it's something that you've already done yeah. that's going to get a mark of the beast and you're not aware of. And so, because that happened later, we can't say for sure, but because John is using this language, I think it's safe to say that probably something like this is happening during the time of John also, even though we don't have historical records. But here's my argument for that. Even though Revelation is murky and unclear, there's history underneath this. It's writing the text. It's writing under the text. There is, there is a history there. And these indicators, these hints that John puts in there, are based upon historical situations. And because John is talking like this, similar language that we know happens 200 years later, we probably can say that this problem is happening during the time of John also. I don't see why you can't. I can't just dismiss the Bible and say, ah, that's not history, that's not, you know, it's just, it's just that Christian stuff. The Bible does have history. Questions? How about the 42 months of power? Uh, I know we've had that 42 months before. Again, just an indication of a uh, limitation. brief limitation. Yeah, yeah limitation. So it's not the, the fact of 42 months isn't important. The fact of limitation is. So I know we've been I've been kind of throwing this around for you guys is that in Revelation these not, these events are not actually happening. He's telling a narrative in a way to people who are going through a difficult time in a way to encourage them. So do actually beasts come out? No. 
but that imagery connects with Rome. Are there actually four horsemen that are going to be unleashed into the world? No. But the events that happen, uh, the, the, the four horsemen kind of unleash, seems like the people have these diff kind, of, kind of difficulties in this time. Will there be a final judgment? Yes. But does God actually have to have books in order to tell if a person is good or bad? No. That's just the way we understand it. All right. You know, you think about judgment. Um, will, it, will every person have to stand in line and, and wait for their judgment moment? Well, you're probably going to be standing in line a long, long time. Seriously. Some people are going to be judged, some are going to be vindicated. Do you think really God works that way? No, that's not the way it's going to be, but that's the way it's projected to us because we can't understand it any other way. God is trying to simplify it so much because we are so simple compared to him. All he wants us to know is, if you stay loyal to me, you're going to be with me. If you're not, you're not. You have difficulty in this world, I'm with you. I can help you. Um, if you go through difficult times and, and you know, you lose your life or whatever else, what happens after this life is much more important than what's going on during this life. So keep your, you know, your, your eyes dotted and your T's crossed. Stay loyal to me. Because what's coming later is endingless. Now the churches are real. But does, God, does Jesus actually have a lampstand in the church? Do we have a lampstand here from Jesus? No. He's not talking about an actual lampstand. He's talking about his presence. Lampstand was always an idea of presence. So we have all these images there. John is telling a, a, telling a story based on historical facts, but he's telling it in a way that's very popular at that time, apocalyptic literature. And it's meant to present a very negative worldview. The world is falling apart. What are we supposed to do as Christians? John would say, cry out to God. God will help you. And also in this message, not only will God help, but we have to be thinking of the ultimate reward. No matter what happens to you in this life, there is a reward after. That's all I got unless you guys have a question. We won't meet next Sunday. Okay? I actually have to. I'll be speaking somewhere. Uh, yeah, we won't pray for camp, too. Um, I'm actually speaking somewhere next week, so I won't even be at church. But uh, then we're going to go in the afternoon to go see uh, uh, my daughter and grandson and son in law. I'm going to have for a moon. So. We won't have anything next Sunday. We'll start up again the following Sunday. And I will, uh, I will uh, have Melinda. I'll try to remember to have Melinda put it in the bulletin. So you guys remember, nothing. You won't have your revelation next week. So. Can I pray real fast? You guys mind if I do that? Okay. Father, we lift up camp to you. We pray that your uh, healing hand might be on him as he's recovering. We pray that the doctors were correct in their uh, diagnosis, and that uh, this will help him to uh, feel better and to be able to function. Uh, according to uh, the way his body is supposed to function, his heart. And uh, we thank you so much that uh, this was caught uh, quickly and he was able to get to the hospital to get the procedure done that he needed to have done. Uh, we thank you for all things. We trust in you for all things. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen.